Thank you for joining us today. We are thrilled to have Major General Kenneth Bibb, the Commander, 18th Air Force, joining us to discuss 18th Air Force Airmen leading innovation and agility efforts preparing for the high-end fight. If you are not an ATA member, please consider joining at https colon slash slash atalink.org slash become a member. If you have suggestions for a future seminar, please email it to ata at atalink.org. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, the United States government, or the Airlift Tanker Association. Please take advantage of the question and answer feature in Teams to submit your questions anytime during the presentation. There is no need to wait until the end of the presentation portion to submit your questions. The earlier we get your question, the more likely we are to get to it in the time allotted. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the Airlift Tanker Association Senior Vice President, Lieutenant General Retired Chuck Johnson to kick things off. Hey, uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody out there and all of our ATA chapters and a special welcome, uh, General Bibb. Uh, really pleased and happy to have you join us uh, for our Leadership Series Seminar today. Uh, for those out there, for as the commander of uh, 18th Air Force, uh, General Bibbs got about 36,000 active duty reserve and civilians that he leads, uh, 12 wings, uh, and also a standalone group, I understand, and uh, over 400 plus aircraft. Uh, as an Air Force Academy graduate, uh, the class of 91, he's coming up on uh, 30 year anniversary. And uh, during that 30 years, he's logged more than 5,000 hours flying the C-5, C-17s, KC-135s, <clears throat> and also the C-12s and C-21s. He's commander of the squadron at Dover uh, in C-5s and also uh, commander of the wing, 100th uh, wing at the UK that we all know about, KC-135s there, and commanded the 618th there, uh, op center, the what we used to call the uh, TACC. So General Bibb, uh, special uh, thank you for joining us today in our leadership series, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Hey, thank you, General Johnson. Uh, what an honor to be here today uh, with our ATA friends. Um, and uh, we truly stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before us. I, I just see ATA as that link uh, from our past to our future. Uh, and, and everything in between. And, and uh, as I look at the, the those you've asked to speak, I'm really humbled uh, to be here today. And originally they said, hey, General Bibb, would you talk about leadership? And and I said, uh, I said, wow, I'm not sure, you know, speaking of General McNabb and our a ATA board and our, our, our former senior leaders, uh, I, I can't imagine, I've got a lot of scar tissue, but I, I'm not sure that's the, the briefing I want to give. And instead, I'd really like to brag on our 18th Air Force Airmen. And um, Chief Bickley is here with me in the room. And and we uh, have the unique opportunity to be out there seeing our airmen face to face. And uh, I'd like to, to show you and tell you a little bit about what, what they're doing. Uh, before I do, uh, you know, as we come up on the Olympics uh, this summer, I was, I was thinking, hey, what must it be like uh, to be the best in the world at what you do? What must it be like to stand on that podium uh, on the top shelf and hear the Star Spangled Banner and get that gold, that gold medal around your neck? Uh, what, what must that feel like? Uh, to be at that Michael Phelps level or the Michael Jordan level, uh, the folks that have done that. And and then I thought, you know what? Uh, I, I know what that feels like because I get to work with our 18th Air Force Airmen every day and our Airmen Across Air Mobility Command. And when you think about it, uh, you know, who is better at what we do uh, than us? Uh, whether it's airlift, whether it's air refueling, whether it's air medical evacuation, uh, the command and control piece, uh, it's phenomenal. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, we have to strive to get better every day, but uh, but the airmen that we get to work with are truly a championship team, uh, and I'm just so proud of the airmen that are out there uh, moving out uh, for our nation. So if we can move to the next slide there uh, on accelerating change. So, it, you know, in 2018, uh, Secretary Mattis gave the gave the order, gave us the NDS uh, to move out and to get, uh, to get ready for the high-end fight. And so we've been working on full-spectrum readiness, and then uh, this last summer, you're aware uh, our new chief of staff, General Brown, uh, com coming out with his uh, his plan on accelerate change or, or lose. And uh, and man, uh, let me tell you, we are all in for that, and it is very exciting. And if you know our boss, General Ben Ovos, saw her on the Today Show this week, 
Uh, we have a boss at Air Mobility Command that uh, that has incorporated that into everything uh, she does and talks about. And uh, she is moving out quickly. And uh, our 18th Air Force Airmen are, are moving quickly to stay with her. Joe Robinson also, if you've ever worked with him, very passionate about our uh, mission and uh, about our airmen and is moving out. And then you've got our airmen, and so, and so I'm going to talk talk about those. And they're not waiting on any guidance that's coming from the middle. They are moving out. They're experimenting. They're coming out with new ways of doing things. And uh, and then you've got the chief and I kind of in the frozen middle, trying to break things loose uh, so we can make uh, things easier and better for our airmen that are doing the mission and, and for our families. Uh, you know, when the chief and I came on active duty, we had about uh, six hundred thousand on active duty. Uh, so that's hard to imagine today, right? 600,000 on active duty. And today, you know, we're running uh, 335, 335,000, maybe a little north of that, uh, you know, with COVID, but uh, about half of what we had when uh, Chief and I came on active duty. And then, um, you know, but luckily we've got plenty of money, right? No, right? Like money's tighter than ever. You know, we went through sequestration in 2012 and, and we're fighting for our, our, our TOA every year uh, for the Air Force to be able to provide the defense of our nation. And so so we got half the people and uh, we've got uh, money tighter than ever. And then, uh, but luckily, uh, not much mission growth and we've got less mission than we had before. No, that's not true either, right? We've got, we've got more mission than ever before too. So as we're uh, tasked to uh, deter Russia, to de deter China, to deter Iran, to de deter North Korea, uh, to engage uh, globally uh, with any potential adversary uh, and, and in the ongoing fights that we have uh, in Southwest Asia, uh, it is a huge uh, mission for our airmen and they are pulled in many ways to get ready for full spectrum readiness. And so, so what does that leave us? More mission than ever, half the people, money's tighter than ever, uh, the only choice we have is innovation. The only choice we have is to do, find a better way of doing things. And the exciting thing is, uh, as Chief and I have been base to base, and so we've been traveling every week uh, over the last seven weeks uh, as COVID has started uh, loosening things up where we can, could travel a little more. And uh, just incredible what you'll see our airmen doing. They are moving out. Almost every shop we walk into, you know, hey, General Bev, hey, Chief Bickley, this is the way we did it two years ago. Here's the way we do it today. And, uh, and hey, I brought this technique, you know, over from McDill, or I brought brought this technique over from McGuire, and or I brought this from from Travis, or hey, we came up with this on our own. Uh, but but they're looking to innovate and, and look at, looking to move out. So um, it is awesome to have a chief of staff of the Air Force and an AMC commander that has empowered our airmen to move out and not wait. Uh, it's awesome to have a leadership that has enabled our airmen to experiment and even to fail and to celebrate that failure. And, uh, and so I just wanted to share a few of those airmen with you and share a few of those stories. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, but there's a few areas maybe that I wasn't completely aware of until I saw our airmen. And so I, I thought, well, maybe there's a few of you that uh, may not be aware of, of some of the things that are going on, but, uh, it, but this, this change culture has really taken hold and it's exciting to be a part of it. So if we go to the next slide, please. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Joint All Domain Command and Control. Uh, the, the, the C is the combined Joint All Domain Command and Control. And, and uh, General Goldfein really put us on this uh, journey or accelerated this journey a couple of years ago and said, hey, you know, we focus on the trucks all the time. We need to step back and look at the highways. Uh, you know, it got my attention, you know, when I was in the TACC, the, uh, the CEO for Alphabet, the, the company that owns Google, came through. And as we walked through the floor of the Take Our Airlift Control Center, Center the 618th, uh, he said, Thad, uh, you know, you you have uh, you're 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 running one kind of operation, moving uh, cargo and fuel around the world. But your real operation, your real value is you're sitting on a treasure trove of data, right? And and how you move that data, and how we control that data, and how we leverage that data uh, for uh, to accelerate your decisions and and uh, what you can do in the decision space is powerful. And, uh, and you've, you've got to create a culture that will go there. And so John Goldfein uh, saw that as well. And so the Joint All Demand Command and Control, very excited about. And what's, what's really neat is seeing the mobility part of that. And I think some folks in the CAF or Global Strike or Space may not at first see uh, how important our mobility forces are in this uh, JAD C2 journey. And so I'll just give you a few examples of kind of our culture change. And, and, and I'll just say we're way behind where we need to be in the fight, right? Our adversaries are getting way ahead of us here. Uh, and when we talk uh, joint all demand command and control, we're really talking decision advantage, and we want to be making better decisions faster. 
And so the, the four examples I'll give you real quick are uh, the upper right corner. Uh, you can see Captain Hannah Riddle and, and her team and put her out of McGuire uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, their team took us on the KC-10 and they said, you know, our airmen are not fluent in tactical data link. Our airmen are not fluent in this language, right? We haven't had Link 16 on our airplane. We haven't had these tools. We haven't had JREAP. And so as we are getting ready to start flying the KC-46 and we're going to have more uh, technology available to us, our airmen, uh, we need to start training on them now to be part of that. And so they were able to get a JREAP Alpha uh, and load that onto the airplane, uh, did all the research to connect it and, and be able to power it up and, and hook it to our current antennas on the KC-10. And so they're able to run a full JREAP Alpha operations on the KC-10 with existing JREAP. Uh, and that had never, never been done before. But this was not a tasker from the command. This was not a tasker from half. This was uh, airmen at the, literally at the staff sergeant level, uh, at the captain level, that said, hey, we got to get after this and we're going to move out. So anyway, very exciting. And uh, th they haven't flown with JREAP yet. We're still waking, waiting on, the, uh, on the, the flight clearance to do that uh, and the airworthiness. Uh, but we're working through that with AFMC and, and, the, and the AMC staff. Uh, and I think we'll be flying with it soon. But, but uh, just to be able to connect and, and, and use that and, and get our uh, airmen uh, uh, more fluent in, uh, in that technology is fantastic. Uh, the next example I'll, I'll give you is that bottom left picture, and uh, you may recognize the co-pilot there is uh, General Wilsbach, the PAC aft commander. And so we don't, uh, we're, we're not that short on crews that we have to use General Wilsbach uh, 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 frequently, but uh, we, we will definitely take him flying with us anytime, uh, anytime we'd like to. And this was two experiments that we ran out in the Pacific, uh, and General Wilsbach was flying on one of them. And I'll, I'll just say that both of these are, are were failed experiments, and you're like, well. Ben, why are you telling us about a failed experiment? And I think this is important for our mindset change. When we ran the first on-ramp one, when I was in AFMC, uh, you know, with uh, for JADC2, the, uh, the team came back and they briefed Dr. Roper, who's in charge of acquisitions for the entire Air Force. And, and they said, Dr. Roper, we're sorry, we only hit about 85 to 90% of our objectives. And, uh, and there was a pause and Dr. Roper stopped and said, he said, yeah, that's a failure because I would expect you to be successful on about 50% of your objectives. If you're hitting 85 or 90% of your objectives and we're setting the bar way too low, right? If we're going to accelerate, we have to be willing to take risks. We have to be willing uh, to, to embrace failure and learn from those lessons and move on. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit, but the KC-46 experiments, uh, we did two. One was uh, with the ABMS development and uh, having a uh, distributed command and control, uh, actually having the air battle manager in the back of the KC-46 uh, and making things happen, uh, which we hadn't been done before. And actually command, uh, working the command and control for, uh, for all weapon systems in the fight uh, using Thresher uh, in the back of the KC-46. And, you know, and what we discovered is, hey, we don't have quite the technology that we need on the KC-46 to be able to do this uh, routinely and successfully, right? So, so maybe a failure overall because you know there were some things we we discovered we couldn't do. But guess what? These are things we discovered. We're able to feed it back to AFMC uh, and into our AMC A5 and, and say, hey, here's the next level of technology we need on the next on the next uh, versions of the KC46 software and hardware. Uh, you know, and then uh, another version of failing fast. Uh, you know, working with the uh, with the Valkyries, the the XQ58. Uh, and working, you know, for with gate one, uh, gateway one payload uh, to basically be that link uh, between our fifth gen fighters. So, you know, the crazy world that we live in that, you know, our fourth gen, our fifth gen fighters, you know, can't even talk to each other without a bacon or without other uh, connections that are out there. And so using the KC-46 in this way to connect, uh, connect everyone in the fight, basically kind of taking the bacon out of that uh, is a very powerful concept. Uh, again, we didn't have full success. There were some things that didn't go right. We discovered there were some other technologies and some adjustments that we're going to need to make on the KC-46 if we wanted to take on that role. Uh, but but it's exciting, right? I mean, so that's the stuff. These are failures we haven't been having before in discussions we probably should have had about 15 years ago uh, that we're not, uh, but but we're getting there, right? And so exciting to see this uh, the, the KC-46 guys out of McConnell uh, moving out with the help of uh, Joel Wilsbach. Uh, the next example I'll give you is that upper left uh, picture. And that's our team, uh, C-17 crew uh, in Germany just last week at Vigilant Shield. And really, uh, this is uh, talking about edge computing, right? So now we put a C-17 that's out there on the edge of the fight, and we have a full data center, right? We have the, 
the global cloud, but then we're able to download uh, a, a local cloud and then be op able to operate uh, you know, forward. So if we get disconnected from the from the global cloud, we've got the local cloud that we're able to move out with. And again, you know, it didn't it wasn't a perfect experiment. Uh, we had we had some failures, uh, but very proud of these airmen for moving out and setting up. And you can see in the back of the C-17, basically setting up that data center uh, for uh, for our airmen and to connect to the fight. And the last thing I'll mention is just on the C-130J. Uh, very proud of our airmen that are moving out there. Um, and you know, anytime we can leverage the uh, the 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 funds of others, the other people's money, the OPM, uh, we want to do that. And you know, Dias, uh, you know, the the uh, tactical data link uh, network that they have out there for the bombers, for the B1. You know, obviously we're co-located there as a partner unit to be able to leverage uh, the technology and the antennas that they have. Uh, for our training. Uh, it's not quite what we need. You know, some of the areas you can't go below 6,000 feet and have reception. You know, guess what? For a C-130 pilot, occasionally we ask you to go below 6,000 feet. So, so you know, n none of these areas are we, you know, at 100%, but I, I see the, and then Little Rock doing the same thing, uh, advocating for uh, more antennas and, and better uh, tactical data link uh, training area. So part of this is, a, is technology, but really the technolo technology is not holding us back. It's the culture change, it's the training, uh, it's the bureaucracy. And so the you know, chief of staff's ABCD orders, you know, getting after the, the bureaucracy to kind of cut through uh, and get the airmen the training that they need to move out. Uh, but I'm very excited about the culture change. I, I've got uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brad uh, Reuter on the line. Uh, also, if there's more technical questions later, but, but I, I told our ATA friends, uh, I talking to Popeye before, it's like, hey, this is probably one we need to come back to in more detail. Uh, for a future ATA brief, because it, it is exciting uh, where the command is going. Uh, we're, we're behind the power curve. We've got a lot of work to do, uh, but it's exciting to see where we're going. Uh, next slide, uh, Mattermost. And, and I know you uh, received a briefing, uh, uh, ATA briefing on Mattermost uh, earlier. I think it was the, the third or fourth uh, briefing. And so, so fantastic uh, for those of you that might not have caught that. And there were some pieces of this that I didn't fully understand. And so I, I think that's uh, I think that's Colonel Johnson uh, in the upper left getting his uh, his flight plan off the fax machine back in 1974, uh, and, uh, and so that, that's the way we used to do business, right? You had to, you know you had to get your paper copy to to move out, and then you you know you got your basically your orders at the window, um, and then you go to the bottom right hand corner, uh, and this is Mattermost. So th this breakthrough has enabled us. So Mattermost is a commercial software. And uh, so it's it's not necessarily the technology, but what's amazing for us as airmen is we're able to put FOUO information uh, on our personal devices by using the software and then further develop it for our use. And we're able to communicate with the crews, with the dispatchers, with the command post. Uh, everybody's on the same page. Uh, so you can imagine if you're setting uh, in Europe and you think you're flying to Rota, and at the window, you know, when you show at the window, they say, oh, actually, you're going to, you know, Dakar, Senegal to land on a dirt strip today. Or actually, you're going into to, you know, do a much more complex or a little uh, or a different mission. Uh, you know, now that mission is going to pop up while you crew us. So you wake up uh, a little early or you're going to come back from breakfast and you see, uh, and, you know, you see this pop up and you're able to get that information and start getting your head around a different mi mission. You're also able to communicate with the dispatcher uh, and the. Uh, um, you know, in the command and control facility. The airman in the upper right there is Isaiah Hammond uh, out of Travis uh, uh, command post. And, and so he's one of those airmen that's uh, loading up matter most and, and would push that over uh, if the dispatcher was unable to do so. And, and he's, he's also revamped all of our uh, quick reaction checklists at Travis uh, to be digital. So so just some of the efforts that are going on. So, so, so break, break. Uh, the other thing that I didn't fully realize until a couple of weeks ago when I was at Charleston, uh, and Travis is um, the open architecture nature of Mattermost, right? So this is not something, my frustration is the TACC commander even is, you know, our global command and control systems. If, if I wanted to make a change, uh, sometimes it was a lot of money uh, and my priorities would not always go to the top of the list. So some things that I want to change in our command and control uh, systems, uh, you know, global systems, working with the contractors, working with the primes, uh, sometimes it was six months, a year, two years, or sometimes they never got to the top of the list to get changed. And it was very frustrating. Uh, here with this open architecture, our airmen are actually doing the programming, right? So we have 8,000 airmen that are logged into Mattermost right now. 
uh, even though it's just in the trial period, period and we're experimenting. And then, uh, and then, Airman, if you want to make a change, uh, you you know insert, hey, this is a change I'd like to make. And then uh, our airmen, we have airmen that are checked out that have, uh, you know, to actually do the coding and pilots, load masters, engineers that in their off time are saying, you know what? Uh, and I, my question was, how do you prioritize it? How do you know which thing to work on, right? There's 8,000 airmen and everybody has different ideas. They said, so everybody votes up or votes down, whatever they, you know, hey, I think this would be a good idea or no, I don't think that would be helpful. And the things that are voted to the top of the list, then kind of a smaller group of the folks that are doing the programming say, hey, from, from Hickam, I can take number three. I think I can get after that one. Or, hey, number six, you know, from Travis, I think I can get after that. And say, and they can actually push the code that we that's operational today. So that's a little different. I think it's a really a step beyond our software foundries, our software factories that we have across the Air Force. So I'll talk, talk about that in just a second. Um, but, but that's very exciting. And then uh, Tron, which is a software factory that's out of, uh, based out of Hawaii, but it's really global. We have airmen that are part of Tron at all of our AMC bases. They're able to actually have a software foundry of folks that are not co-located. So let's go on to the next slide. I, I want to make sure I leave time for questions. You can tell I'm pretty passionate and excited about uh, what our airmen are doing out there. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, Conjure. So on uh, it's, Scott Air Force Base is the, the home of Conjure. Uh, you're probably aware we have about 15 software factories across the Air Force. And uh, these uh, software foundries or software factories, uh, you probably heard of Kessel Run, you probably heard of Ski Camp, you probably heard of Space Camp, right? So uh, within each of the MAGCOMs, they have uh, this capability. And, and the amazing part there is, again, we have open architecture and we have our airmen, uh, you know, Kessel Run that are, uh, you know, sitting there in downtown Boston in shorts and flip flops. Uh, but it's airmen that we've taken off the line, we've taught them to code or, or taken their coding ability to the next level, and they're able to make these changes. Um, and it's what I didn't realize until I got into this job is that uh, Air Mobility Command, we have Conjure uh, that's right now in 18th Air Force is, uh, is run uh, here by uh, Colonel Gramling over in the Com Group uh, in, one of her, in uh, one of the Com Group squadrons. Um, but uh, but they, they've been getting after a number of, of different projects for the command. Again, this open uh, architecture, we're not having to go back to the primes. We're not having to go back to uh, the contractors uh, to make updates and make changes. Uh, so a couple of their pro projects, and I won't go into detail, but Magellan, Mercury, you may have heard of, are, are some of the projects that they've come up to that are accelerating our missions and accelerating support for our airmen. Um, and then uh, and the back, kind of back to Tron, I think the next level of that, so these are airmen that are actually assigned here working that, or Kessel Run or airmen that are assigned to Boston, sitting there uh, coding and working. Uh, Tron, to me, takes this to the next level because these that's, you know, based out of Hawaii, but we have airmen at our AMC bases, our 18th Air Force bases that are uh, checked out to code as part of Tron uh, and uh, programs like Puckboard, uh, which our airmen are using for scheduling functions. Uh, you know, literally the puck that I would have used even uh, as a squadron commander uh, with my name on it to go fly, that, that digital program and concept uh, that shares information with, with the entire squadron uh, is, is being worked uh, all by Tron. So all those updates are, are happening, happening virtually from airmen that are make, making their own changes. So even within the last 12 months, I think that's a big change for our Air Force. And, and these airmen are getting after it. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll hit these next few pretty quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. But uh, this is uh, Dover Air Force Base. This is Talon. Uh, it's the Tactics and Leadership Nexus uh, is what they're calling it. And what they found uh, about two years ago is they ran through some exercises. The exp expeditionary mindset of being able to fight through a contested environment, uh, some of that mindset was lacking in, in some of our airmen, right? So they said, how do we get after this? And so they set up an expeditionary area called Talon. Uh, it's got a leadership reaction course as part of it. But but what they saw was, uh, you know, when they first started this was our airmen came under attack and we had some that were back on their heels and some that said, all right, I got to go duck and cover and wait out the attack and then get back to my job. And they're like, no, 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 airmen, uh, you know, in, in the next fight and even in our current fight, we've got to fight through, uh, fight through adversity, fight the base, defend the base uh, and launch our missions. And so uh, the leadership reaction course part of it, there's a chemical part of it that they are able to log off their chemical training, but they're actually in their full, full chemical ensemble and they get gassed. Uh, there's a portion where they have to uh, design a base defense and then another group attacks the base 
and uh, and and they actually defend it with rubber bullets. So if you get hit, it hurts. It's not just you know, it's not paintball. It's 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 uh, more painful than that. Uh, Chief and I got to go out there and 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 shoot and be part of the and uh, go through part of the course. Uh, but uh, this is uh, Major Katie Griffin from the Force Support Squadron uh, attacking the course. And so there, Airman, the mindset change, uh, the feedback I've seen from even from the A1C level of the mindset change they have of building team teamwork. Uh, fighting through a contested environment, I think, is important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, ACE, so Agile Combat Employment. We're getting after this across the command. And I, again, I think this is another uh, entire briefing. I, I think it may have been a previous one for ATA. In fact, I know it was. I, I saw the ATA uh, for the, our sessions we had during the ATA uh, in October. Uh, but I think it's worth coming back to because this is changing so quickly uh, and we're getting after it. And this is not just an 18th Air Force thing. This is across the Air Force. Uh, Exp Expeditionary Center and A4 have the lead on this, so I'm not trying to take any of their thunder at all. They, they are the experts, but I do want to brag on some of our airmen that are experimenting and providing feedback to our experts uh, as we further develop our CONOPS and CONOP. Um, so this was uh, in theater. Uh, the CENTCOM commander asked us to move out uh, as part of, part of Agile Combat employment for hot pit refueling. So uh, in future fights, if we have a tanker that lands, uh, on an island or, or at another base, and we need to turn it quickly, uh, how can we cut down on that turn time to get this airplane back in the fight? And and so the, the hot pit refueling allows the tanker to land and refuel with engines running uh, without having to shut down all the engines. And so uh, that's uh, that's exciting. This was successful. We still have some work to do here, but just another example of our airmen uh, from Fairchild McDill uh, deployed and, uh, and McConnell as well, um, making this happen. Next slide. Uh, just a quick shout out for Agile Combat Employment to Little Rock and Dias. And, and I really see our C-130 brethren as being, uh, along with the Contingency Response Wing, uh, being some of the experts in trying to figure this out and trying to trying to get better at this. And uh, so this is Senior Airman Milton Delsed uh, out of Little Rock uh, at one of our exercises at 29 Palms. Uh, and, and way too much to go into here, but just a few of the experiments that I'll give you examples of. Little Rock is really taking the lead and, uh, on their portion of it and, and what's in their uh, sweet spot has been uh, developing the math lead wing concepts. Uh, they've also taken advantage of other things like the aerial bulk fuel delivery system, uh, the AVFIDs, uh, they were able to, usually that's something we don't train on until we get to theater, uh, just because it's in WRM, they were able to get some of that out of WRM for their airmen to train on, train on uh, to get better and to work through that. Um, they've even done uh, some post-radiation work. So they uh, probably have all of our wings uh, operating in a post-radiation environment. Uh, that they've worked through the most uh, experiments and, and successes and failures uh, in looking at that. For Dias, also leading the way uh, in, in tactical data lake, but also with dynamic uh, ACE, uh, they're calling it. And so I think sometimes we set the bar too low. Uh, and so as we're working with our CAF friends, uh, for them, thinking uh, uh, thinking agile combat employment, it may just be to one base. Uh, we deploy them there. Uh, we turn we turn some sorties quickly, and we get them out, right? But for the mobility side, that's really mobility ops. That's that's one on one for us, right? If we're flying you into Homestead and uh, set up a location and drop you off, and then come back and pick you up, or or stay there and help fuel you, and then and then get you out of there. That, that's kind of our bread and butter mobility, right? Uh, and so re really for the dynamic uh, ACE, Agile Combat Employment, uh, DIAS has, has been pushing the envelope to, to really have the uh, different mobs, to have the different FOBs, uh, uh, main operating bases, forward operating bases, and then moving out uh, to the different contingency locations and not giving the crews the plan ahead of time. And so we're at the, at the cutting edge of this, but we're really trying to push our CAF friends uh, to have more complex scenarios and so that the lessons that we're able to learn uh, are, are more uh, valuable to us, um, especially on the mobility side. But really, I think it's where the whole Air Force needs to go. So, so awesome for, for Little Rock and Dias uh, being two of our wings. And all of our wings are involved in this. All of our wings are, are doing ACE experiments. And so I, I, I know there's a couple of wing commanders that are sitting out there going, hey, you know, me too. But, uh, but really proud of our 130 team really seems to, to be embracing this and has taught us a lot. Next slide, please. And then uh, just another shout out for the uh, Exhibitionary Center, uh, John Cameron team, uh, the coursework that they're coming up with 
to help us get the multi-capable airmen. So, you know, at each of these contingency locations, you'd have a small group of airmen that are cross-trained. We've been doing cross-utilization training for decades, uh, but having the right airmen there, that's hard, and not having a footprint that's too big, that's hard to support, but not too small, that where you're too vulnerable, uh, is really going to depend on the mission. And so we've been, the con, the con, con ops has been uh, bouncing back and forth between USAFE and PACAF as we've uh, gotten their combat-oriented um, uh, perspectives. And so that's been very helpful. And then the Expeditionary Center moving out for training. We had our first uh, group of 21 airmen that just finished uh, their three-day course in February, uh, just over the last 30 days. And so very, very proud of our airmen for getting out there and, and uh, completing that MCA course. And then a lot of lessons learned with the EC on, on how we make that course better. Uh, the, those 21 airmen are taken uh, back to Little Rock, uh, uh, a short course, a two-day course, on multi, you know, it's not going to check them out as you know, given give you an AFSC as multi multi capable airmen, but it will uh, help us with that expeditionary mindset. So they're they're going to put 300 airmen, 50 at a time, uh, through that uh, through that course over the next six months uh, to help with that expeditionary mindset for multi capable airmen. So so big big shout out to the EC and what they're doing for us. Um, you know, at each each of these locations, it's not easy. Command and control, maintenance, munitions, fuel. You know, how does a small set of airmen enable us to do that? Uh, some of this gets uh, classified pretty quickly, so I don't want to go too far, but um, but so proud of our airmen for not waiting for somebody to tell them to do this. They're just they're just getting after it. Next slide. And I'm, I'm a minute or two over, but I, I will mention full spectrum readiness in the sense of, and again, I have to be careful not to not to go too far on the classified side, but um, but we are blocking off. Big thanks to the A3 for allowing us to block off training and tails to put live in theater uh, for uh, tanker operations to be able to do large large scale formation, large ship, MCON 4 at night in the weather uh, and really looking at, you know, working on our precision timing, the multi-cell large formation with our receivers as well, uh, autonomous uh, formation leadership, and then the integrated planning and operations uh, that our MPCs require. Uh, this is this is really taking it to the next level. It's stuff we yeah we should be good at already, but it takes practice, it takes reps, it takes training, uh, and to see uh, our this is centered around our KC10 right now uh, with some involvement with the 46 and the and the 135. But um, and you know my question is hey how come we can't do this as part of our joint exercises and our other exercises that are going on and, and in some cases we do, but uh, to some extent you know our tankers usually get stripped off for other requirements for the combatant commander. And we end up, you know, being the, the, the gas station, but don't get after all of our requirements as airmen on the tanker side. So very excited what they're doing. We're doing the same thing uh, with on the airlift side, C-17 large formation, uh, you know, with uh, Rainier War, with McCord, uh, with uh, Paul Beto Challenge, uh, with Charleston uh, are getting after this as well. Next slide. I'll just mention just another, you know, innovation, innovation and moving out for a nation. Uh, you know, I think you've seen the press on this, but uh, 90 days from back of the napkin uh, to uh, fully operational, uh, the ne negatively pressurized, con pressurized connex to move uh, positive uh, COVID patients or, or patients that are positive from another communicable disease. Uh, this is incredible, right? And so to see our airmen, uh, I got to meet the AFMC airmen that designed this. Uh, over the summer and put this into place. Uh, what other nation in the world in 90 days could could build this and be flying it on missions and saving Americans and saving our allies worldwide uh, under a national uh, pandemic? So, so, so very proud of them. And then our AE Airmen for moving out and making that happen. Next slide. And then, you know, in similar context, I'll mention our spark cells when it comes to innovation. So most of our bases have some kind of spark cell uh, that is an area for them to integrate and to crosstalk and to get better every day uh, and, um, and to, to talk innovation across uh, weapon systems, across different career fields. Uh, these are two of our airmen. This is Shane Walford uh, wearing a, a, a 3D uh, or a, 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 a additive manufactured uh, face mask. And so um, in the, as we were short in the early days of COVID, uh, on the right is uh, Airman Jacob Smith, uh, and he's uh, he's at Charleston. And this is showing him. So I, I showed you the NPC, but we developed the NPC. But if you remember, we didn't have enough hand sanitizer in the nation, right? You couldn't buy it. You couldn't find hand sanitizer. So this is literally uh, Airman Smith in his kitchen 
uh, mixing hand sanitizer. Uh, he got the uh, he got the formulas and was able to get the materials and uh, made uh, the Palmetto Spark uh, hand sanitizer there in Charleston. So it's just another example of our airmen moving out uh, without being asked or, or told to do so. A uh, couple other quick stories on our innovation cells. As a McGuire uh, saw an airman in the, uh, there was a, a 3D printing expert in the uh, in their innovation cell, and I said, "Hey, how did they? Uh, how did you get to be the expert?" And they said, "Sir, we actually found him. Uh, we were doing a dorm inspection, and uh, this airman had two 3D printers that he owned in his dorm room." And uh, you know, so that's my story of what, why you should do a, a good dorm inspection, right? You may find out some things about your airman. So they were able to get him as a as an instructor in, in 3D printing and additive manufacturing, uh, just with his his knowledge base. You know, at uh, another base, I met a captain last week that owns two software companies, right? So this is an aviator in our Air Force that already owns two software companies and has moved out and is you know pro probably doesn't need the the money we're giving him, but but wants to serve. And it's helping us innovate and take things to the next level. And then, uh, you know, and then each of our bases in our in these uh, uh, innovation cells are getting areas of expertise. So, uh, you know, Travis on using uh, drones uh, across uh, across the base, whether it's security forces or CE, is one of the areas they're focused on, uh, as well as the Mattermost and others. Uh, you know, Scott here, their Elevate cell is working on base defense and innovation there. So exciting. Next slide. VR training. So this has come so far just in the six months that uh, Chief and I have been in place uh, to see our airmen. So this is this is airmen at Dias uh, going through their training. Uh, they have uh, 16 stations uh, and they're able to, you know, so Chief and I have both done this. You're able to not only just crawl around the airplane in the C-130 or the C-5, are our two most capable systems with VR right now. But you're able to do a tire change, you're able to do a jacking operation. And uh, I, I, was, I was a little wrong trying to do a, a jacking operation and I asked the instructor, I said, I think, I'm, I think I'm doing something wrong. I think I flipped the switch wrong or something, it won't let me start. And he said, sir, you don't have your PPE on yet. You gotta select your PPE and get your PPE on before it'll let you start, right? So just learning so much uh, in our airmen, not only are they in there with instructors and this is cutting down on their touch time with aircraft, so, so, you, so you're, you know, eliminating the need for for ground trainers and putting more airplanes in the fight. You're also getting them trained quicker. They're able to go in there and get reps. They have, you know, at Dias, they have study hall where you can go in there on your own and, and run through any of your checklists and procedures and practice that so you can get checked out, uh, you know, to work on your three level or your five level. So anyway, exciting work going with VR, uh, virtual reality. Next slide. And, and quickly, I'll just add VR. It's not just for our maintainers and our operators. Uh, Chief and I went through suicide prevention training last week. Very powerful to sit there in a virtual reality classroom, to sit there across from Tony Dungy as he gives us instruction on uh, suicide prevention techniques. Uh, this is a huge problem across our Air Force. Uh, and so um, it, just a completely different way of looking at the training. And I think our airmen will really embrace this. Uh, and then, you know, after, you know, sitting there with Tony Dungy and, uh, and Coach Calhoun's office there at the Air Force Academy, and that, that's pretty cool just to sit in Coach Calhoun's chair and, and look around the, the campus. Uh, but then uh, to be paired up with an airman that's in need, that's hurting, that, uh, that needs you to, to, to make the save, uh, and it's very realistic. And it doesn't let you pick on things on the screen. You have to actually sit there and it'll give you three choices and you have to read and you have to say the words. And when you say those words, you know, some of the things, if, if, if it's something that is going to help the situation, the situation improves a little bit. And if it's something the wrong way, you know, you'll get an adverse reaction from that airman as you're trying to help them. Uh, and I, I just found it is very powerful in, in the wave of the future. So so it, it's common and, uh, and well worth the investment, I think. Next slide. And, it, and uh, you know, as we're talking now about innovation uh, for resilience and connection, uh, just examples of how our wings have moved out in COVID. So, you know, your your uh, staff sergeant promotion ceremony usually be at the club shoulder to shoulder. We can't do that uh, because of COVID. Uh, our base is here is Colonel Wiederholt and uh, Chief Gomez uh, Gomez out at, uh, at McGuire. And they said, you know what? Uh, we'll have it outside. We'll have it six feet apart. Uh, we'll let the airmen come up. They'll have a walk up song. They'll get a jersey. Uh, and, uh, and what a memorable staff sergeant cer ceremony with their families uh, and everybody out there outside able to cheer them on. 
And so some of the things, I think this is probably a better ceremony than we would have at the club shoulder to shoulder, right? So some of the things we're doing in COVID, it's forced us to innovate and uh, be better than we were. And just so excited. I've seen this at all our bases. I can give you a hundred examples of how our leaders are using innovation, innovative ways to connect with our airmen. Next slide. All right, I'm, I'm getting close to the end here. Uh, Task Force West is probably a whole other briefing we could give you, but just another example of using innovation to connect with our airmen. Uh, and, um, you know, we're losing more airmen to, to suicide and mental health issues than we have to COVID. And so taking some risk to get out with our airmen and to have that face-to-face -face time. Uh, this is a brand new uh, uh, coffee trailer that the chaplains have at Little Rock. Uh, but the bigger story is, you know, they're, they're getting True North, uh, which is additional manpower for resilience for our airmen. Uh, but until we get that, they're not waiting. They moved out with the manpower they had for Task Force West to put their uh, their providers in the units. And so this isn't new, right? We've always had it maybe for the last couple of decades. We've had a chaplain that's been, been in the Holy Roller or had a chaplain that's, you know, in your squadron. But this is more than that. So they've taken their whole Airmen and Family Readiness Center. And so, for example, if you want to go see the financial counselor, you have to go into the LRS warehouse. And in the LRS warehouse, she's got her office with popcorn popping and airmen stopping by. And, and they've really taken their uh, family support and airmen support and put all of that out to the airmen uh, and, and to our families uh, on the front line. So just another way of you know innovation for resilience and, and real proud of our team for doing that. Next slide. And I went a little long, but I'll just wrap up by saying uh, what I said at the beginning. We stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before us. Uh, this is the Berlin airlift. Uh, I, I think General McNabb may be in this picture. I'm not sure, uh, but uh, but we are uh, so proud of the, the heritage that we have and the airmen that have gone before us, but the innovation isn't something new. And uh, I, I know we're all familiar with the Berlin Airlift stories. The story I wasn't familiar with was uh, Mass Sergeant Paul LeBeau. And Mass Sergeant Paul LeBeau, when they had a, in January, they had a big ice storm and all the airplanes got iced up. They uh, were gonna have to have a ramp freeze for several days. And instead, he was able to get a jet engine, put it on the back of a truck, uh, strap it on the back of the truck, and use the heat from the jet engine to melt the ice off the airplanes and have them ready to go. They built six de-icers from scratch from jet engines. And so we tell our airmen, hey, we, we don't expect you to go find a jet engine and put it in the back of a pickup truck. Uh, but, but it is, this innovation thing is in our blood as airmen. We find ways to getting things done. And, uh, and, and it's awesome to be part of that tradition. So I... Sorry I went a little over time, but um, thanks for the opportunity to get to speak today, and I'm happy to take your questions. So, Popeye, back over to you. General, thanks so much. It's so great to see your enthusiasm and how proud you are of all of our airmen and all the wonderful things they're doing. Uh, the first question that we had was, can you talk a little bit more about where we are with JADC2 and what's next? Sorry about that. I, I'm, uh, you know, I, like I said, I'm not the expert on JADC2. Um, I, you know, I gave you an example of where I think we're going with a number of our weapon systems. Um, you're probably familiar with all the ones. I'm looking at my sheet here with you know the, the, the 26 ones, everything from Feed One to Cloud One, Gateway One, Smart One, Spectrum One. And so really this is a, an entire Air Force you know, enterprise effort to get at this uh, uh, dec decision advantage uh, and to take us to the next level. And um, there's a number of experiments that are going on. I, I do think, um, you know, right now I feel like we're working on technologies uh, that are catching us up to where we should have been uh, 12 to 15 years ago, maybe. Um, and so, well, it's maybe discouraging in, in some aspects. Uh, if we don't take these first steps now, uh, we're never going to get to where we need to be and to be able to, ex to accelerate further. And so a lot of it, uh, I, I do think, is uh, on the training side and the culture side and uh, get, have an airman think this way. And the, the thing that thrills me is as I go out and I, uh, so I've, I've got Colonel, Colonel uh, Reuter on the line. Uh, there's absolutely one of our, you know, handful of experts across uh, the MAF and really across the Air Force on JADC2. Um, but, uh, you know, my question is how do we make the next Colonel Reuter, right? How, where, where does the next Roto Reuter come from? And, but as I, I get out there right now, it's self-study. So I, I see these captains and I'm like, oh, it's you. You're going to be the next, you know, rooter. I can see it, right? You know, because they're briefing me, and they can they can go to the nth detail on on where we need to go and what we need to do. Um, but it's self study, right? There's no program that takes you this way. So part of my challenge, I think, as the DT chair, is you know how do we develop the next generation of digital airmen? Um, you know that, and that's part of our um, 
you know, not not just the informal study on your own, but how do we put that into our, our formal processes? Uh, Brad, would you like to chime in and, uh, and add something to that? Hi, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Lieutenant Colonel Brad Reader, I go by Roto, and I'm the command, Air Mobility Command's lead for JADC2 and, and ABMS, um, as we currently know it. Um, so I think the next steps for the MAF, um, interestingly enough, is, is that as Dr. Roper departed office, he, he put the Rapid Capability Office in charge of the next ABMS um, uh, development, and they've actually targeted the KC-46 for the next set of uh, prototype capabilities. A little bit of what we've done in the past, uh, in past experiments, but actually bringing that to a more, um, a, a tighter uh, package, if you will, both for enabling the joint force primarily, but it'll also give those uh, calm gaps that we that we saw in earlier experiments, the the TLC they need to to um, go forward. And the, and the goal is that those are prototypes right now, but they can inform obviously the next uh, later blocks of KC-46 as uh, General Bibb alluded to. Um, so that's, that's the next, phase uh, specifically to JADC2 and ABMS, the Air Force uh, overall is still sort of adjusting to the to, to the new direction of RCO. Um, and so we'll see how both our markdowns from Congress and um, that uh, that RCO development sort of changes things. But uh, th th those are the next few steps for the math, sir. Over. Awesome. Thanks so much, both of you, for that answer. The next question follows on that. It's an anonymous question. It says, sir, you mentioned all these great innovations. How is 18th Air Force and AMC making resources available to scale them? No, I think that's a great question. And, I, and General Van Ovost is really getting after this. And so just in the last couple of months, you know, I, I think she shares the frustration of our airmen. So we come up with these great ideas, we innovate, we experiment. And then uh, it's hard to get them over into programs of record or expand them across the force. And so uh, she stood up a lead for innovation uh, in her front office. And, uh, and then is picking the, the top ones that we want to get after across the command, the top innovation ideas, uh, and then assigning a, a general officer to be a champion on each of these ideas to help see it through. And this, I mean, this is a challenge we have across the Air Force. I mean, and coming from AFMC, uh, a lot of things that we do in AFRL, a lot of technologies that do, do we develop, uh, and then you know getting those over to the other side to have them funded and and to be scalable. It's not just an AMC problem; it's across you know, Department of Defense and across across the Air Force. But uh, but let me tell you, we have a boss that's getting after it. Uh, she's not afraid to put finger in the chest of her general officers, uh, i.e., me uh, and, uh, and my my brothers and sisters here here uh, at at Scott and and uh, McGuire. Uh, but but uh, we, we've got a long way to go. One of the things that our uh, one of our airmen said when I was in Elevate, the, the innovation uh, cell at Scott, uh, he said, you know, sir, I would rather uh, come up with four quarters than 100 pennies. And I, I think that's the challenge of our leaders at all levels. So there's a lot of innovative ideas out there. But how do we really pick, the, okay, here's the four things that we really think we can get after and we can spread that across uh, across the force. And some of these things are not, you know, high dollar items, right? Some of these ideas are uh, process improvements and other things that we can get after today. The things that need to be funded, the need, things that need to be in our programs or record, uh, especially though, you know, how do we, and part of that is squadron commanders, wing commanders, you know, group commanders, wing commanders, NAF commander doing that. You know, on my team, I've asked our team to, to better track you know, he's, who, what, what are our key 18th Air Force innovations and, and how are those being tracked across the staff? Who, who's got the stick for those? And then how do we flight follow those? So I think that's something we haven't done very well uh, in the past, or, you know, I think we've tried to do, but it's something that we have to reemphasize and, and our boss is all over it. So so we're, we're, we're getting after it and we'll, we'll, we'll see how we, how we get. So more to follow, maybe at the fall ATA, you know, we can have an update on, on the top AMC, you know, 18th Air Force innovation uh, you know, I, I ideas, you know, where, where we're at and what the, where the roadblocks are, uh, but it's a challenge. Great question. Thanks, sir. The next question, I think something that's on a lot of people's mind, with the stand-up of the U.S. Space Force, what opportunities do you see for airlift and Space Force integration, and how is that partnership forming? Yikes, I, th I think that's a really tough question. I, w one of the great things about this, the birth of the Space Force was uh, was seeing General Raymond. I actually got to have dinner in General Raymond's house uh, right before that announcement was coming out. And and uh, General Golfing. I mean, those 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 two were very tight. And the relationship between the Air Force and Space Force. Uh, you know, General Golfing's like, hey, you know, we have already been through this once uh, when we separated from the Army from the Army Air Corps. 
And, uh, you know, there's still maybe a little scar tissue today between us and the Army. And we're working through it. And we're much better than we were. But, you know, let's start off from day one. And our goal as airmen is to uh, create a successful Space Force and do everything we can to make them successful. And so on the, uh, I think I think we've been doing that. I think we've been trying to put up, push forward our best airmen for the Space Force. I just swore in a uh, Master Sergeant from my staff, who I hate to lose because he's very talented. Uh, but we're, we're giving the Space Force our very best uh, airmen, uh, NCOs, senior NCOs, uh, officers uh, to succeed. Um, and then I think I'm hoping by having some of our mobility airmen in the Space Force at the ground level, uh, that that will help with those ties. And you're a little out of my uh, out of my uh, out of my wheelhouse here for you know what are we doing and for on the mobility side to connect to the Space Force. Uh, I, I do that, think that's probably something we need to get after, and and I, I guess uh, you know over to, to General Kramer and the A58 kind of on where where you know where that would go. Um, but uh, I think it's a great question, and I, I don't have an easy answer for that one. Over. All right. The next question is from a Mr. Bill Wellsler, and he wants to know what's your what's your current role in the joint fight, um, short of just the interactions with uh, Transcom, and what's your interaction with the joint team. No, that's great. Joe Welzer, uh, honored to have you on the line. Obviously, uh, former commander and, and former 618th uh, AOC commander as well. Uh, thank you for thank you for joining us. Great question. Uh, so as you know, we've gone through a, a big transition uh, over the last uh, over the last two years. Uh, John Barrett was the first two star to take back control of the uh, 18th Air Force as we moved from a CNAF to a CMAGCOM. Uh, so that's changed our role some. Uh, but I will tell you, I, I, I view 18th Air Force and the EC uh, so somebody said, well, sir, so you're just, just ADCON, you know, I was like, well, uh, well, yes and no. I mean, I mean, yes, we have ADCON, but, uh, you know, we have the C code just like any commander at the squadron commander, group commander, wing commander, uh, AMC commander, we have those responsibilities, right? And so we organize, train, and equip to get our forces out the door. Uh, so we get feedback on how we're doing, uh, from the joint community on that organized train and equip. Uh, sometimes that's good feedback. Sometimes that's things we need to do better. Uh, we have a, a good relationship uh, with General Lyons at Transcom. Obviously, most things we're going to work through the AMC staff, uh, but we have that direct line uh, with his staff as well on things that we need to do better on the organized training and equip. Um, you know, with our with our partners downrange and uh, around the world, um, I, I I guess I was surprised at the uh, quick phone calls I got after taking command from my NAF fellow NAF commanders around the world uh, that we're needing help working mobility issues, uh, need mobility expertise and working together uh, for success uh, for the importance of their COCOM mission. And so as our airmen uh, employ, uh, whether it's tankers, airlifters, or AE mission, uh, our, our entire mission set, as we go forward, uh, I was surprised at the kind of NAF, to NAF uh, discussions of the number of those that I had in the early days, whether that was 3rd Air Force uh, in Europe or 11th Air Force or things we're working with 9th Air Force. We have a tight relationship with 19th Air Force at AETC, well, well, not joint, but on that organized training equip side, um, that, that's uh, with all the changes coming from AETC with our uh, aviator training. Uh, th those are our tight relationships we have as well. So uh, definitely different relationship than we had uh, as a CNAF. Uh, but I think uh, I think we've the staff here and, and our team has fully embraced uh, our role as uh, uh, in command. Our command chief just came from CINCOM, set two doors down from General McKenzie. Uh, and so... Uh, so having that relationship, uh, you know, with the with the CENTCOM staff and his experience coming off the line at CENTCOM, you know, he's he's uh, uh, made me aware of several things that we need to change as we organize, train, and equip uh, with our forces as they go forward, and the the need of the warfighter and the importance of uh, of keeping the warfighter uh, and our combatant commanders uh, need satisfied and requirements satisfied. Over. Great, sir. The next question is another anonymous one, but it says uh, we heard at the last in-person ATA about K-Wedge. Uh, do you know when it will be fielded and how our local commanders can accept some risk and start using it now? All right, you're, at, you're out of my comfort zone on this. I, I will fully admit when I don't know something. I'm, uh, Chief, can you help me? K-Wedge? Not something I'm familiar with. So so the K-Wedge asker, if you're still on the line, if you can hit, hit me offline uh, with, with a little more about it, and then I'll, I'm happy to dig into that one. Or if you want to circle back with another anonymous question, uh, but that's that's not a program I'm familiar with. I, I, Copy I, that, sir. I, I, I'm familiar with the wedge tail, with uh, the wedge tails with our next, uh, uh, on the, uh, the, the AWAC side, but, uh, but not K-Wedge, thanks. 
All right, I'll give you a, one uh, softball question here. This is actually a question I like to ask a lot of our guests. Can you tell us a story about an airman that made an impact on you? Oh, I <laughs> see, see, see if I can do it without without shedding a tear. I uh, just yesterday, uh, Chief and I were at Dias, and uh, and we went to the memorial for uh, Torque Six Two. Ooh, uh, it, it was tough. We met with, uh, and, th and this is not an airman story, but a key spouse story. We met with two key spouses that had been there and uh, talked us uh, through their uh, experiences, uh, helping those families with uh, Torque 62 uh, when we lost that aircraft. Ooh, God, I didn't mean to get emotional there, but uh, if you could tell, I, there, there wasn't a dry eye in the house yesterday. And uh, our, our airmen, uh, man, they, in our families, so, um, sacrifice so much, and we're so proud of what they do every day. And I think they hear firsthand um, just just how, um, how important um, these connections are. Uh, sorry, you know, I, I think it's uh, I, I think, think I get something in my eye here once in a while. Not not, not crying here, uh, but uh, how important these connections and relationships are. And when things go wrong. Uh, having these families and these airmen next to us uh, to get us through. So anyway, my, like I said, more emotional than I wanted to get there, but um, some really touching stories around the Air Force. And I can tell you another, you know, uh, similar stories from almost every one of our bases of our airmen stepping forward uh, and uh, being very passionate about our mission and very passionate about um, taking care of each other. So anyway. Man, sure, you should have the softball. That was, that was supposed to be easy. I probably made that harder than I should. Usually, no. I, I I love you. I love your passion and your uh, emotion about our airmen, uh, and and that's really I think one of the qualities that makes you such a great leader. So, a uh, quick update on the K wedge. That was the 2019 or 2020 Spark submission from uh, Staff Sergeant Kaiser at the Eighth Mobility Squadron. It's a C-17 loading aid to to prevent damage on the logistics rail system. It actually uh, got presented at, at ATA uh, with the Spark tank stuff uh and uh they're, they're not seeing it in the field yet and want to know what the holdup is obviously if it's not something you know about we can get offline and get you that get that answer out to that person hey hey uh make sure we have your uh, contact information we'll track that one down and like i said that was my one of my good news to the staff in february i was like hey I, I would like to know what our top 18th air force innovation ideas are where they are in the staff uh if they're getting fielded if they're not getting fielded why uh, so we're still getting after that. that that's uh, that, that's on my to-do list, and uh, we owe you better. So, so sorry I wasn't tracking that one out of ATA, um, but like I said, I, I know General Vanovo's staff is, uh, and we'll, we're going to get smarter on those. So that, that's one of my, you know, I, I, I'm learning every day, trying to be a better NAF commander every day, and that's an area that that I want to get better at. So, so no, yeah, noted, and, and thanks, and we'll circle back with you on that one. We owe you that one. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I asked for their uh, contact info on that. But back in uh, 2019, I'm lucky if I can remember what I had for breakfast today, no, not to mention remembering 2019. So uh, I think you're still doing OK, sir. That's going to conclude our question and answer right now. I'll, I'll turn it over to you uh, for closing remarks before I head it ba hand it over back to uh, Lieutenant General Johnson. No, thank you very much. Uh, just appreciate the opportunity. What an honor to be here today. What an honor to tell the story on our airmen. Uh, and, and just the impact that they're uh, having on our nation. Uh, incredible uh, what they're doing every day, and, and we're, we're just so proud, uh, if, if you can tell that. So um, for our airmen out there that are still serving, uh, and the, those that are in 18th and, and otherwise, uh, thanks for what you, ever, you do every day. Thanks to your families. Thanks for your service and sacrifice. We've got you know less than 1% of our nation serves in uniform. And uh, just so proud of this team that serves every day. So thanks again for the opportunity. And if anybody has any follow-up questions, uh, please shoot them to me directly, and, and, and we'll get back to you because I, I know we didn't get get to a lot. This is this is a, a crazy time for our na nation. This uh, last year with COVID, uh, with diversity inclusion, with racial relations, uh, with the with the attack on the Capitol. Uh, I mean, on and on, right? And at the same time, uh, protecting our nation uh, from, from potential adversaries uh, is absolutely essential. Our airmen have stood up in every way, and uh, we're part of the best Air Force in the world and, and uh, very proud of our 18th Air Force Airmen. So thank you. Well, thanks again for your time, sir. Over to you, General Johnson. Hey, General Bibb, that was outstanding. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I got to say, I learned a lot uh, with uh, everything that you talked through. and. I think what I really liked most uh, was uh, every single topic, how you weaved uh, airmen 
you know, mobility airmen uh, in all and every one of those uh, different topics from um, hot pit refueling, T land, conjure, um, the experiments, et cetera, which um, I've always been one to, hey, let's go try it. And uh, we may not be too successful, but we'll certainly learn from it. And maybe it'll come up with another idea or approach. So I, I appreciate your leadership in that whole area. It's good to see uh, our 18th Air Force and in turn our Air Mobility Command and in turn our Air Force is in such good hands with leaders like you still on active duty. So uh, blessings to you and thanks to me and uh, for doing this with us all today. Thank you. All right, sir, that's going to conclude uh, what we have on the program today, but uh, we do have an exciting announcement about what's coming up next. So make sure to mark your calendars for 19 March when we'll be joined by the CEO of the Gary Sinise Foundation and former commander of Global Strike Command, General Retired Robin Rand. It will certainly be an event you do not want to miss. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, the United States government, or the Airlift Tanker Association. Please send comments and suggestions for future topics and guests to us at ATA at atalink.org. Thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you on the 19th and thanks for all that you do. <laughs>